Hi guys, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in New York. Today's video is on the subject of blood pressure and in particular the white coat syndrome. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is that the medical fraternity is obsessed these days uh, with treating numbers using pills rather than doing what it should be doing, which is educating and empowering patients. We are more interested in, teach, in treating populations rather than treating individual patients. And there is nowhere where this is more apparent than in the field of blood pressure management. Now, let me try and just talk to you a little bit about blood pressure and then we'll talk about the white coat syndrome. The first thing to understand is that the reason blood pressure or high blood pressure is important is because high blood pressure is associated with complications over a number of years. If you leave high blood pressure to be unchecked, then there is a higher incidence of things like heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure over a number of years. If you take two groups of patients, uh, and one group carries has a high blood pressure number, an average number, say let's say 150 over 100, okay? And this is their blood pressure, and you leave them without any treatment for say 10 years. And then you take another group of patients who have a blood pressure number, an average reading of say 120 over 70, and you leave them without anything for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, you try and work out how many of these people have had strokes and heart attacks, you will find that the group um, which has the higher blood pressure reading will probably have a higher number of heart attacks, strokes and kidney failure compared to the group that had the lower blood pressure reading. However, it doesn't automatically follow that every single patient in that group with the higher pressure, blood pressure will have a heart attack, stroke or kidney failure. Some people won't and some people will. And it doesn't automatically follow that the group that has the lower blood pressure will be in some way immune to having heart attacks, strokes, or kidney failure. Some people will still have heart attacks, strokes, and kidney failure. It's just that if you counted the numbers at the end, you'll find that the numbers are slightly or are greater in the group that had the high blood pressure to start off with. Um, the problem is this so so the, the, the and the reason is because it's not there are so many other factors that come into play um, there are factors like age comes into play uh, comorbidities come into play genetics come into play uh, lifestyle comes into play and luck comes into play and all these things also dictate what happens to people regardless of what their blood pressure is. It's also worth noting that people who have high blood pressure are, do tend to be have a higher incidence of being overweight and diabetes etc and all those things also add their own risk um, and the overall difference that you see is probably confounded. It is not just about the blood pressure difference. It's probably also all the other things that go along with blood pressure that are conferring their own risk, which explains the difference in the two populations at the end of 10 years and the, number, the difference in number of strokes, heart attacks between the two groups. If, hypothetically, you took two groups which were identical in every single way, so they had exactly the same age, they had the, they had the same genetics, they had the same lifestyle, they had the same luck, they had the same comorbidities, and the only thing that was different between the two groups was the blood pressure number, if you followed them up over a long period of time, you would probably still see that there was a difference, and that group which had the higher number would probably have more heart attacks and strokes, but the difference between the two groups would be much smaller when you um, when you control for all these other confounding factors. So really, when we're trying to treat the blood pressure number, we are actually trying to make a difference to that small number of patients. The problem is that to try and make a difference to that small number of patients, you have to treat a very large number of patients to start off with at the outset. So you treat everyone, and if you treated everyone, you would probably make a difference to that small number of patients. And I guess that's okay, provided the treatment didn't have an associated cost. The problem with blood pressure treatment is that it requires medications and the medications do come with a cost. The cost is side effects, the cost is expense, the cost is inconvenience. Um, 
And the worst thing about this is that you treat all these people and no one will quite, so you treat all these people in the hope that someone somewhere will benefit, but no one will ever know who that someone somewhere is. You will never be able to say this person has benefited. As a person who has taken the blood pressure tablets all their life and put up with side effects, etc., you will never know whether you are the person who has benefited from those medications, because how do you know? Just because you haven't had a stroke doesn't automatically mean uh, that the blood pressure medication has prevented the stroke. Maybe you weren't destined to have a stroke anyway. So this is the inherent problem with treating a large bunch of people because yes, you're doing it, but you're treating a population in the hope that someone will benefit, but that person may not even be you and you will never know. So what happens these days is you go to uh, a doctor, the doctor measures your blood pressure, and then he says, oh, you have high blood pressure, and then he starts you on medications, and you are consigned to those medications for the rest of your life. The doctor thinks he has done good by you, but actually what he has done is that he has not done good by you. What he has done is he has tried to do good by uh, the population which he believes you to be a member of. He has not taken into account you as a person's values, you as a person's preferences, you as a person's expectations. He has just treated you because he thinks you are part of that population and the hope of treating that population, he hopes that someone in that population will benefit. So there has to be a better way because otherwise you treat a huge number of patients, put them through the indignity of um, um, side effects, etc. and uh, for a very small benefit. To, tr to know how to treat high blood pressure, I think a better way is needed. To know how to treat high blood pressure, we have to understand what high blood pressure is. Now, this is also very interesting because at this point in time, high blood pressure is defined by a number. And the problem with the number is it's neither something that is universally accepted, nor is it steadfast. So if you take a bunch of people and say, what is high blood pressure? You will get different values for the number. The Americans say that high blood pressure is a number of greater than 130 over 80. The Europeans say that high blood pressure is a number greater than 140 over 90. So if there's that discrepancy, what does that mean? Does it mean that if you are European and you, that does it mean that your risk changes depending on which continent you're in? Um, and the other thing which is really interesting is that numbers change. So the Americans once upon a time used to say that the blood pressure of 140 over 90 was high blood pressure. Then they change it and they said, oh, now 130 over 80 is high blood pressure. The numbers aren't even steadfast. So I personally don't like the idea that you define high blood pressure by a number. To my mind, if your blood pressure is truly high for you, then it must be causing you some sort of damage. What I'm trying to say is that high blood pressure is associated with some sort of damage to the person whose blood pressure is high. Otherwise, it's not high. It's not high for that person. If you have a high number and it's not causing you any damage whatsoever, then that number is not high for you. Okay. And if you have a number which is looks normal compared to everyone else, but it is still causing damage to you, then that number is high for you. And I think it's really important to understand that and think of blood pressure, high blood pressure, as a number that is actually causing you damage. And therefore, if you can work out whether the number is causing you damage, then you can be more confident about treating the number in the hope that the damage will get less. Um, and thereby you can choose those patients to treat based on whether they're demonstrating signs of damage. And that way you are more, you know, the number, you're treating fewer patients, but a bigger proportion of those patients will benefit. So the question then is, let's talk about damage. The first thing to understand is that it's not that you have a high number, nothing, and then one day have a stroke. What you have is if you have a blood pressure which is high for you, it will cause low level damage over a number of years. And that low level damage will then translate into high level damage, which is externally visible. The low level damage may not be externally visible. By that, I mean that the patient doesn't know that they're having that low level damage going on in their body. No one from the outside can tell that they're having that low level damage going on in their body. 
until that point where high level damage occurs, the patient has a heart attack, which they'll know about and everyone else will know about, or the patient has stroke or the patient has kidney failure. So if we can detect low level damage, then that is very that can be very useful because it can identify those people whose blood pressure is high for them regardless of the actual number. Now, uh, in terms of trying to understand low level damage, this is also called target organ damage. Um, the thing to understand is that patients with, high, with when you have high blood pressure, our tiniest blood vessels tend to suffer the consequences of the high blood pressure first, which means that we have very tiny blood vessels and those tiny blood vessels tend to be fragile. And if our blood pressure is high, those tiny blood vessels can burst. And when they burst, they cause a little bit of tiny microscopic bleeding and then they heal by forming blood clots. Uh, and so if you can visualize these tiny blood vessels, you can tell whether there's low level damage. And you can visualize these tiny vessels because um, one of the best places to visualize these tiny blood vessels is in the back of the eyes, in the retina, uh, where you have the tiniest, tiniest blood vessels. So you can actually, a skilled doctor can actually look into the eyes and see whether there is evidence of damage to these small blood vessels. And if there is, then that tells you that that person's blood pressure, no matter what the number is, is probably high for them. Um, this is called hypertensive retinopathy. Another place where you can detect low level damage is in the kidneys. Okay, the tiny blood vessels in the kidneys, if the blood vessels are damaged, the kidneys don't work as effectively and the kidneys start losing more protein. They're not able to absorb as much protein, they leak protein out into the urine and that protein can be detected by a biochemical analysis of the urine and that tells you. So another thing a doctor can do to detect that low level damage is uh, assess the urine and look for protein in the urine that that will tell them. And this is called hypertensive nephropathy. Finally, it's worth knowing that the heart has to pump blood around the body. And if you have these tiny blood vessels that are getting damaged and healing by clotting off, the amount of resistance that the heart has to pump against was going to go up because there's less blood vessels to pump the blood through so the heart has to work harder and as the heart works harder it adapts by becoming more muscular and you can actually look at the heart uh, on an echocardiogram and if it looks more muscular then that is another clue that that number is high for you and in that setting if you can identify that that number is high for you because you're already showing signs of low level damage then it obviously makes sense to be very aggressive about treating the blood pressure to minimize that low level damage. But if there is no low level damage, then one can be far more reassured that that blood pressure may not necessarily be high for that person. Of course, it's always a good idea for um, people to look after their lifestyle and wherever a doctor is worried about high blood pressure, they should always counsel people to lose weight, to eat healthy, to get good sleep, to manage their stress, etc but one doesn't necessarily need to consign them to medications for the rest of their life um, because at that point, there is no evidence of low level damage. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this thing called white coat syndrome, okay? So, what is white coat syndrome? White coat syndrome is a phenomenon that is observed during blood pressure measurement and um, when you're measuring the blood pressure of patients. And what you find in white coat syndrome is that the blood pressure that uh, is measured in a medical environment by a doctor or a nurse in a medical environment is discrepant with what is actually going on in the patient's body or it is not truly representative of the patient's real blood pressure and it is not truly representative of, of low level damage, i.e. the number may look excessively high but the patient is not suffering any consequences of low level damage and actually when you take that person out of the medical environment their blood pressure is lower, the numbers are lower compared to what are measured in uh, a medical One other thing to understand about the white coat um, syndrome is that whilst a lot of people think that uh, the the discrepancy is only that it's abnormally high in the blood pressure uh, in, a, in a medical environment but lower outside the opposite can also be a white coat effect where the blood pressure may be uh, falsely low 
or falsely normal in a medical environment, but actually be higher um, outside the medical environment. So it's wrong to think that a white coat effect only refers to blood pressures being falsely high in the presence of a white coat. Uh, they can also be misleadingly normal in the presence of a white coat, but actually be higher and have associated low level damage in the body outside um, of that medical environment. The problem with the white coat syndrome is obvious, okay, that um, in those, you know, it means that people get may get put on tablets when they don't need those tablets. It could be that people who are already on tablets are told that their medications are ineffective. It could be that, um, you know, by over medicating people based on those readings which are discrepant you could subject them to more side effects and the consequences of low blood pressure and also another thing obviously is in those people who have masked hypertension which means that they actually have high blood pressure but when they go to a medical uh, setting their blood pressure looks relatively normal in those people the worry is that you may miss uh, treating aggressively the blood pressure because you're relying on that number which is measured in the medical environment which looks okay but actually the patient may still be at risk of the consequences of high blood pressure and associated low level damage in the body. Um, so those are the problems and that's why white coat, hyper, white coat syndrome is important. Now white coat syndrome consists of three distinct entities and I'll talk you through them. The first is something called the white coat effect. Okay. The white coat effect relates to those people who already are taking medications for high blood pressure. So these are people who have high blood pressure or who have been diagnosed with high blood pressure. They've been put on two, three different medications. And despite that, every time they go to the doctors, the blood pressure is excessively high, above 140 over 90. At that point, the problem is the doctor may turn around and say, look, your medications aren't working. Let's add more medications. The patient takes more medications goes out and then starts suffering the consequences of low blood pressure or side effects of the medication and they come in with falls etc etc and they're being unnecessarily medicated so in that setting when you have a patient who has high blood pressure is already taking lots of medications and the blood pressure still appears to be high in the office in the doctor's office the right thing to do is either to say before changing the medications is either to say go and do some home-based readings and if the home-based readings are below 135 or 85 then that confirms a white coat effect or an ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure reading which takes multiple measurements over a 24-hour period and then you calculate an average and if that average is below 130 over 80 then that confirms a white coat effect and it means that that patient doesn't need more medications okay uh, in terms of one question you may want to answer is, well, do people who have a white coat effect, are they at greater risk of low level damage compared to those people who are on the same medications but don't have a white coat effect? And the answer is there's no convincing evidence that those people are at a higher risk of low level damage uh, compared to maybe slightly more, but not by any means significantly more. It's not absolutely definitive. So um, the white coat effect is generally considered a benign thing, okay? Uh, and it's good to pick it up so that you don't get unnecessarily over-medicated. The next uh, group of patients who have fit in this white coat syndrome thing is uh, a group of patients who are called white coat hypertension, okay? In those patients, what tends to happen is that these people don't actually have um, uh, excessively high blood pressures, but when they go to their doctor's surgery, they get anxious, they, they have this white coat uh, response, and their blood pressure is excessively high. Uh, and in those people, um, the the you know the, and this happens in about 25 to 30 percent of patients who go and have their blood pressure measured so they'll go the gp does the blood pressure and finds it to be about 140 over 90 and then therefore they raise the question could this be uh, high blood pressure in this setting what should be done is the first thing the gp should do is not base treatment on the first reading what the gp should do is either invite the patient back 
for at least another two or three times to the clinic and repeat the blood pressure and see if it's consistently above 140 over 90. But more importantly, what the doctor should do is make sure he looks for signs of low level damage. If he has seen signs of low level damage, then that person probably needs aggressive treatment of the blood pressure. But if there's no signs of the low level damage, then the question really is, is the number high or high by the guidance issued? Or is that number normal for that patient as per the guidance issued? And for that reason, what you have to do is ask for the patient to measure some blood pressures at home um, uh, or alternatively have 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. And if the blood pressure is measured at home, the average is less than 135 over 85. Or if on ambulatory monitoring, the blood pressure is less than 130 over 80, then that patient has white coat hypertension. Uh, in that group, uh, we have some evidence to suggest that people who have white coat hypertension have a higher incidence, two and a half fold higher risk of developing true high blood pressure as time progresses. So in those people, what the doctor should do is a look for low level damage. If there's no low level damage, should definitely be advising the patient on lifestyle modification and then keeping a watch on the blood pressure at regular intervals, ideally by 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. The third group of patients who have this white coat effect are probably the riskiest patients or the patients at most risk. And these people have something called masked hypertension. In masked hypertension, what happens is that when the doctor does the blood pressure, the blood pressure looks okay. But actually, when you go outside the medical environment, the blood pressure is higher or those people already have some evidence of low level uh, damage. Uh, within the body to their eyes to their kidneys etc and in those people it's incredibly important to be aggressive about treating the blood pressure regardless of the number that is measured in the doctor's surgery who are these people these people generally tend to be a little bit younger but they have other comorbidities they have diabetes they have sleep apnea they're obese etc so i am very suspicious when someone comes to me and they say look i'm diabetic and i'm obese but i don't have high blood pressure i just wonder whether they have this thing called masked hypertension where the number may not be high but actually the consequences of high blood pressure are happening within the body and i tend to be very very um skeptical of that and I would always look for low level damage and I would always be aggressive about risk factor modification and wherever there's low level damage I'd be aggressive about starting that patient on medical therapy because it tells you that the blood pressure is in addition to everything else is beginning to affect their bodies. So I hope you found this really useful. I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear uh, your thoughts about this um, but in essence I think it's really important that we look for the thing that matters, which is low level damage, rather than just acting on the number, because it's clearly obvious that the, there are people who are at risk and may have a, a normal number, and then there are other people who have a high number and may not be at risk. And it's important that the right people get treated, and those people who don't need aggressive treatment with tablets, which could cause side effects, don't have to have them. So uh, I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. All the best.